would go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 3. We've been moving through Mark, uh, the book of Mark, and we've just come through a uh, significant section of, of tension and confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of the day. And now as we come to this section of, of Mark, I want us to pause for a moment and consider a few things. Why are you a Christian, if you are a Christian. I mean, I don't know if you call yourself one or not. But if you are, if you do, why? What is it that you hope to get out of your faith? What is it that you hope to get out of obeying the Scriptures and what they teach? Think about that. You know, the fastest growing version of uh, Christianity or of a brand of Christianity, um, I wouldn't actually identify it as true Christianity at all, but one of the fastest growing versions of Christianity is what is known as the prosperity gospel or the, the health and wealth gospel. In reality, I don't think it should be called any kind of gospel. I believe it's a false gospel. It, does, it doesn't actually reflect the gospel of the scriptures at all. But according to the prosperity gospel and according to the health and wealth gospel, you should come to Jesus because Jesus can give you stuff. Jesus can, can fix your marriage. You should give money to the church because if you do, then Jesus will give you even more money. All you have to do is name what you want, claim it, and Jesus is obligated to give it to you. As long as you have enough faith, it's yours. That is the prosperity gospel. If you have enough faith, God will heal you of every disease and grant you all the money that you want. Now, there's, there's a lot of problems with this teaching, not the least of which is that Ironically, the only people getting rich on the prosperity gospel are the teachers themselves. They have hoodwinked so many people to giving into their ministries, but the people who give aren't actually reaping the rewards of that. It's just the teachers. But there's a bigger issue. And the bigger issue is that it's a false gospel. Because the reality is, is Jesus did not die on the cross to save you from poverty. Jesus Christ did not die on the cross to save you from your physical ailments. That is not why Jesus died. Yet that's what many of these false teachers of these prosperity teachers would claim. They would say, Jesus wants you healthy. Jesus wants you wealthy. But that's not what the Bible teaches. So we have people, people like Benny Hinn, Creflo Dollar, Joel Osteen, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Meyer. These are all very explicit teachers of this prosperity gospel. There are other teachers that are more subtle. I don't know if you know any of these names. Names like Stephen Furtick of Elevation Church, Carl Lentz and Brian Houston of Hillsong Church, Bethel Church in Redding, California, those engaged with that ministry. They all engage in the prosperity gospel. Now, you may be more or less familiar with, with some of those names. Maybe you've heard of all those names. Maybe you haven't heard of any of them. But what if I told you that there might be a version of a prosperity teacher in this very room? What if I told you that that person might be sitting in your seat. And I think, well, well I'm, I'm not a prosperity teacher. What, what, are you, what are you saying? Well, let me ask the question again. Why are you a Christian? 
what do you hope to get out of your faith? If the answer to that question is anything less than Jesus Christ or anything more than Jesus Christ, we have some serious thinking to do and evaluation to do. It can be easy for us to, to point to these prosperity teachers on, on TV and different, different people and decry them as false teachers. That's easy. But so many of us, so many of our churches, just like ours across America, are filled with people that are practically living out prosperity teaching in their lives. And I know because I've done it. I've done it. Consider these questions. Have you ever gotten mad at God? If you've ever been mad at God for circumstances or situations, that is a form of prosperity teaching because your anger assumes that you deserve something else and that God owed you something else and he didn't give it to you. Anger at God is a form of a prosperity teaching. You ever tried to make deals with God? God, you know, I, I, I want this. If, if you get this to me, if you, if you work this out in my life, I will do this for you. Tying your actions to the blessing of God in different areas. That's prosperity teaching. It's subtle. We don't recognize it as prosperity teaching, but it is. I've done that. I've had those prayers. What about this? You ever think about something that needs prayer? It's something big, man, I, I need to pray about this. But then you hesitate because you go, man, you know, I just, I haven't been doing pretty well in my devotions this week. So, you know, I, I'm going to wait to ask for this thing until I get, you know, at least a good four or five days in a row of good devotions going, and then I'll ask God. I can't tell you how many times I've done that. I've done that so many times. That's prosperity thing. Again, it's tying God's earthly and physical blessings directly to my faithfulness or lack thereof. And that's exactly what prosperity teachers teach. So we can all be engaged in this. We can all have these tendencies to slip into prosperity thinking. And so when we ask this question, why am I a Christian? We need to consider this. This is important because many people who claim to be Christians, they do so only so that they can receive the blessings, only so that they can receive physical blessings here on earth without regard to who Jesus Christ actually is. And I want us all to ponder before you start thinking in your head, well, that's not me. Seriously think about this and consider whether or not we fit that description or not. Many people will try to sell Christianity to other folks by saying, you know, if you come to Jesus, Jesus will fix your marriage. If you come to Jesus, he'll help you out of, you know, with your finances. He'll help you out of that financial hole. If, if you come to Jesus, he'll help you with your physical disease or your ailment, or he'll, he'll help you break that habit that you don't want anymore. Can Jesus do those things? Yes, absolutely Jesus can do those things. But is that the promise of the gospel? Is that what he promises to do? No. In fact, Jesus says that if you aren't willing to lose your marriage, lose your family, lose your livelihood, if you aren't willing to, to lose those things for the sake of him, you're not worthy of him. That's what Jesus says. So if everything in your life falls apart, if your children die, if your spouse cheats on you and abandons you, if you lose your job, if your house burns down, if you get hit by a bus and you never walk again, what then? What happens to your faith? Would you cling to Jesus because he is worthy to be embraced by the nature of who he is as the creator and sustainer of the universe? 
Or would you abandon him like so many others have in the history when they face these difficult times? The spiritual thing is to say, no, no, I would stick with Jesus. I would die for Jesus. That's the spiritual thing to say. But for how many of us is that seriously true? And I, and I hope we would all remain in our faith. I, I really do. But these kinds of events have driven away so many people who had previously said they would die for Jesus Christ. Why? How, how does that happen? How does someone get from a point where they say they're embracing Jesus Christ and they say, yes, I would die for Christ, and yet when the hardship comes, they walk away? How does that happen? happen. I think it comes back to the answer to this question. Why did we come to faith in Christ to begin with? And are we coming for the right reasons? Today we're going to see some folks that that seemed to be embracing Christ in, in the gospel of Mark, but in reality they they were not doing it for the right reasons. And when those reasons fail them, they, they too will fall away. We're going to see some stark contrasts today between several characters in the book of Mark. As we move through chapter 2 and, and we're coming into chapter 3 again, we see these, these series of incidents where Jesus has confrontational interactions with the religious leaders of the day. The Pharisees are interacting with Jesus on different things. Jesus is is seeking to establish himself as one who has preeminent authority. He proved, I have authority to heal. I have authority to teach. I have authority to cast out demons. And I have authority over the established religious traditions of the day. We've seen all that as we come through chapter 2 and into chapter 3. But the Pharisees... These religious leaders, they're having none of it. And tragically, they reject the Messiah. Jesus offers the kingdom. And the Pharisees say, not if you're the king. In fact, they're so dead set in their rejection that they're willing to go so far as to begin plotting how to kill Jesus. If you remember from last week, Jesus asked them that pointed question, what is better to do on the Sabbath? Is it better to to do good or evil? Is it better to save life or to kill? It was a pointed question that exposed the, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. They thought that Jesus shouldn't be healing on the Sabbath, which was a good thing to do. But on that very same Sabbath, they went out to plot murder against Jesus Christ. And that question exposed their hypocrisy. represents outright rejection of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And they're not willing to accept him. And that's tragic. It's tragic for the Pharisees. And we talked last week as well that we too can be rejecting Christ, right? Every moment that we live not embracing the gospel of Jesus Christ is outright rejection. We might think, well, I'm on the fence. I just haven't decided yet. But the reality is that's rejection. Every moment not accepting is rejecting. But then even as Christians, even as believers, where we say we have embraced Jesus Christ, every time we sin, we reject the Lord. Every time we choose to do something, every time we choose to set up our own rules, and enforce them as if they're God's rules, we're rejecting God. We're rejecting His authority. That was last week's sermon. As we consider this week, we see the religious leaders in their outright rejection. This week we see the crowd. They have a surface level acceptance. Read with me of Mark chapter 3. In verse, starting in verse 7. It 
says, Jesus departed with his disciples to the sea, and a large, large crowd followed him from Galilee, and a large crowd followed him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan, and around Tyre and Sidon. The large crowd came to him because they heard about everything he was doing. Then he told the disciples to have a small boat ready for him so that the crowd wouldn't crush him. Since he healed so many, all who had diseases were pressing toward him to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he would str strongly warn them not to make him known. So as we look at these verses, these verses function as a little bit of a summary passage in the midst of Jesus' early ministry. Jesus has been going from town to town, teaching the good news of the gospel, teaching a message of repentance and faith to enter the kingdom of God. That, that has been his message, and he has been healing from place to place. And now he has kind of settled back into what is kind of known as his home base in, in Capernaum is where he's at. And all these people are flocking to him. Jesus is generating so much fame from the works and the actions and the things that he is doing. And they're coming from him from such a wide region. Notice in, in verses 7 and 8, we see the words large crowd several times. And the word crowd is used again later in verse 9. So this is, there's a huge emphasis here on the size, the massive size of the group of people that are coming to Jesus. We see them, we notice where they come from. Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan, Tyre and Sidon. I have a map here and it's kind of hard, hard to see. I was hoping that would show up a little bit better. Um, but if we were to look on this map, this is the Sea of Galilee. And right above the Sea of Galilee is where Jesus has set up his home base in Capernaum, right in here. Now, they're coming from these wide regions. So Galilee, that's this region here. And then it, they're coming from Judea, which is down here. Jerusalem is down here in Judea. And then Idumea, that's further south. Beyond the Jordan, that would be considered all this region on this side of the Jordan River, which runs down from the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea. And then Tyre and Sidon. Tyre is this city here. This area of Phoenicia is also known as the region of Tyre, and then Sidon up here. So we have this massive geological territory that people are coming. We're talking hours and hours and hours of walking for these people, especially the, coming from these, these far-reaching areas in north and south. Most people didn't have transport animals to get around. They would have had to walk. And they're flocking to Jesus from all these areas. This is a huge geographical area that they're coming from. It's astounding that, that the, the reputation and fame of Jesus is spreading so far. Not only are these places so far away, but they also represent diverse groups of people as well. So these areas of, of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, those would have been predominantly Jewish areas. But once you get to uh, these other areas like Idumea and then beyond the Jordan, those were mixed areas. They're Jews and Gentiles living together, uh, intermarrying amongst each other. And so you had some mixed families in with those. And then Tyre and Sidon, those were predominantly Gentile cities. So you have this wide breadth of, of, of people coming from this wide geographical area, coming from a wide range of ethnic backgrounds and cultural backgrounds, coming to hear Jesus. But are they coming to hear Jesus? Or are they just coming for other reasons? Are they coming to, to hail him as the messianic king, the one that will sit on the Davidic throne? Hail him as Messiah? Unfortunately, not. Look in verse 8. It said the large crowd was coming to him when they heard about everything he was doing or because they heard about all he was doing. 
Jesus is preaching the good news of the kingdom. He's teaching with authority. He's changing the fundamental understanding of the religious practices and codes of the day. People aren't interested in that. They're interested in their physical health. They're interested in what Jesus can do. Jesus, can you fix, can you fix my legs? Lord, can, can, you, can you heal me of my leprosy? Can you help my arm, Lord? Lord, Lord help this demon go away. And it's, it's understandable why they, they would want that. I mean, if, if my legs didn't work and, and I knew of a way to, to fix that issue, I'd pursue that for sure. And that's what these people were doing. They were, they were so enthralled, was trying to get to him so much. They were pressing upon him. And, and look what it says in verses 9 and 10. He, Jesus had to tell the disciples to have a small boat ready for him so that the crowd wouldn't crush him. They're literally pressing upon him so much, trying to get to him, trying to get to him that Jesus has to make preparations for his own safety so that he doesn't get trampled by the people. They were pressing so hard to get him in order to be literally avoid literally being crushed by the crowd. He has to have this boat ready so he could go out to sea. And the, the words in verse 10 are, are striking as well. Since he healed so many, all who had diseases were pressing toward him to touch him. That, that word pressing toward literally has the idea of falling upon someone. They were literally falling over Jesus trying to get to him, trying to touch him. Lord, heal me. I want this, this, this ailment that I have gone. Really falling over Jesus to get to him. because they heard about the things that he was doing. This is not a crowd that recognizes who Jesus Christ really and truly is. If they did, they would have behaved much differently. Now, they, they do stand in contrast to the religious leaders, because the religious leaders, they had outright rejection of Jesus Christ, and the crowd seems like they're accepting him, right? They're, they're thronging to him. The Lord, looking to him for, for help in this way. This large crowd from this such wide region. Seems like they accept him. But they only want the physical blessing that Jesus can provide. Rather than wanting Jesus for who he is and Jesus himself. And we know this is true because if we were to trace this concept of the crowd, this, this word for crowd is used throughout the book of Mark. If we were to trace that word of the crowd throughout the book, we would find them in different spots along the way, always interested in what Jesus was doing, always interested in the physical things of Jesus' ministry. But then when we get to the end, when push comes to shove, the crowd cries out, crucify him, rather than falling down before him. They have a surface level acceptance. But here's the deal. Surface level acceptance is rejection. If we're coming to Jesus because of what we think he can do for me, that's surface level acceptance. That is rejection. These people, this crowd, they haven't truly embraced Jesus Christ. They're only embracing him for what he can do. What happens when those things that he can do go away? Jesus won't be physically on earth forever, right? He's going to return to the Father. What happens then? You know, when... When Lizzie and I met, I had significantly more hair than I've got right now. And one day, I'm probably going to look like Pastor Larry, or Goddard. My hair 
It's going to be gone. But if Lizzie married me because I had great hair, we'd be in big trouble. That would have been a surface level acceptance. And if I married Lizzie just because I thought she was beautiful, which I do, but if that was the only reason, we'd be in trouble as the years go. Because one day, this hair, it's, it's a receding hairline. It's going to keep going. It's not going to stop. And, and natural beauty has a tendency to fade over time. So what is our relationship built upon that is going to cause it to last? And if it's not built upon an acceptance of who each other are, that relationship will fail. And the same is true for our relationship with Jesus Christ. If our relationship is built on the the things that we want, the blessings that we might seek to get out of this relationship with Christ, if it's built upon that, when we lose those blessings or if we never get those blessings that we think were promised, we're in trouble. That relationship will not last. Surface-level acceptance is rejection. And I think it's possible that this is where the majority of the evangelical church in America is today. And before you think in your mind, yeah, those people, they need to truly embrace Jesus like I have. Before you go there, examine yourself. Think about this. Why am I a Christian? Why have I come to Christ? What do I hope to get out of my faith? How much do you love Jesus? A lot? A little? How much? Bang! Your kids are dead. Now how much do you love Jesus? Bang! Your spouse is dead. Now how much do you love Jesus? If we are not willing to see Jesus for who he is and embrace him for who he is and not for the blessings of this earth. When those things happen, it will lead to rejection. There's an old, simple song. It's, it's, a, it's a Negro spiritual that communicates, I think, a powerful truth. In the morning when I rise... In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have this whole world, but give me Jesus. If you lost everything in this world, could you sing that song with integrity? Give me Jesus. He is infinitely valuable to me. The crowd could not. They embraced Jesus for for what he could do. They failed to recognize who he was and ultimately led to their rejection of him. There were other people present in this passage that... uh, They did see Jesus for who he was. Ironically, it was the demons, the evil spirits. Verses 11 and 12. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he would strongly warn them not to make him known. (laughs) It's so strange. Jesus is out here demonstrating who he is. The religious leaders, they're like, nah, no way. We're going to kill you. The crowd is just like, oh, yes, we want these physical blessings. There's going to come a time when they're going to cry, crucify him. And we have these evil spirits. They're the only characters in the narrative so far that really seem to know who Jesus is. They say, you are the son of God. And that stands as a stark contrast as well. 
the contrast between the Pharisees and the crowd, there's outright rejection versus surface level acceptance that will lead to eventual rejection. But now you've got the demons who are, have this contrast between the crowd where the crowd was literally falling over Jesus trying to get to him to get the blessings says that the unclean spirits would fall down, not on him, but before him. They knew who Jesus was. And they knew that they had to submit to him because of who he was. So they cry out, you are the son of God. Which is an accurate statement. Jesus Christ was, is the son of God. We have Jesus telling them to be silent. You might just go, well, why? What's going on? What's, what's the issue here? This, this actually marks the third time already in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is commanding these unclean spirits to be silent. Why? When they seem to be the only ones who know who he is and are willing to make that known, why is Jesus silencing them? A few things for us to remember. First, Jesus is very careful about how he reveals himself, and he does so progressively and intentionally throughout this book. He knows what too much information too quickly will do. He knows the timeline that he is working on. He knows what he has to accomplish on this earth, so he is revealing himself progressively over time. So for the demons to speak out about who Jesus was in his fullness may have upset the perfect timeline so jesus did not permit that in his sovereignty he silenced the demons second there's the issue of source and i've i mentioned this before when we encountered this earlier in this book uh, but the demons are not a credible source of information if a demon says something probably shouldn't be listening to that source right it's it's not a good thing to be listening to it's not how you want your information sent out. So Jesus is silencing them so that he can reveal himself in his way, in his time, with proper sources. And third, though the demons are speaking truth here when they say, you are the son of God, that is not an act of worship on the part of the demons. It's not. If we were to go back and see Mark uh, chapter 1, verse 24, we find this. The demons, they come to Jesus, and this is what they say. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. True statement. He is the Holy One of God. This is not a statement of worship. They're not there to worship him. They know his power. They know his might. And they know what they deserve. They know who Jesus is. And they fear him. They have come before Jesus and they fear him. If you're familiar with the, with the history of demons as revealed in the scriptures, we know at one point that they were all angels before God, serving in his presence. When Satan decided to rebel against the Lord, many angels rebelled with him. And these angels have become known as demons or unclean spirits, evil spirits. They once did the, the ministry of the Lord, and now they do the bidding of Satan. Though they're falling before Jesus, they're not accepting him. They're not embracing him as Lord. They fear him. See, they already rejected Jesus long ago when they did rebel. James 2.19, you believe that God is one good. Even the demons believe. And they shudder. They tremble before God. Not because Jesus is a wicked tyrant, but because he is a good and righteous and faithful judge. And they know what they deserve for their rebellion and their rejection of the Lord. The fact of the matter is that one day Jesus is going to 
judge not only just the demons, they know it's coming and they fear it. And it's not just going to come to the demons, but to the whole world. And those who have rejected Jesus, like the demons, like the Pharisees, like the crowd, will also one day fall before the Lord in fear. Again, not because Jesus is a wicked or cruel tyrant, but as a righteous and good judge, he will give everyone exactly what they deserve. Only a wicked judge will allow the evil, the guilty, to go free. And Jesus is a good and righteous judge. So we have choices to make. We have things to think about. Will you reject Jesus outright like the Pharisees do? And every moment spent in not in, in, in a fail, every moment spent in a failure to embrace Jesus Christ is rejection. Don't fool yourself by, by just saying, oh, I'm thinking about it, or I'm, I'm just not sure. Every moment is rejection that is not embracing and accepting. Will you reject him even now as, as a Christian? Every time we sin is that rejection. Will you have surface level acceptance of Jesus, embracing him for what he can do? It's only skin deep. In reality, that is rejection as well. Will you face Jesus one day and cower in fear? Again, not because Jesus is abuse but because he is a righteous judge? Or will you embrace him fully? Ask, makes us ask the question, what does that mean to embrace him fully? If these people are rejecting him, it seems like they're accepting him, but they're not. If they're rejecting him, what does it mean to embrace him? For us, for Christians, for those who, who have trusted in Christ for salvation, that means delighting in Jesus Christ as our inheritance. Though we might have our financial struggles on this earth, maybe we'll have them our whole lives. Maybe we'll have health issues our whole lives. We might have relational difficulties as long as we're alive. But if I've got Jesus... I can deal with all of that because I've got Jesus Christ. Embrace that relationship. So while we might labor and we might pray and work to try to resolve those issues, we know that we get to spend an eternity with Jesus Christ. Embrace that. Now, so many people say, and I understand what they mean when they say, oh, I, I, I want to go to heaven when I die. Well, sure, we all want to go to heaven, but I want to be with Jesus Christ. Heaven just so happens to be the place where that's going to happen. But heaven without Jesus Christ is no heaven at all. To embrace him fully, to delight in him for who he is, to embrace him fully is, is to follow his teachings and his commands. Our prize is Jesus. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And when we fail to do that, we are failing to embrace him fully. All sin is a form of rejection. So maybe you're here and you're not yet a Christian. You have not embraced Jesus Christ. Jesus has been demonstrating who he is. He's the king offering the kingdom to all who will repent and believe. He is the one who has authority over all things in this world and the universe. And in the last few chapters of the book of Mark, we're going to see him being put to death. He'll be bearing the punishment that we deserve so that we don't have to face him as judge. Instead, we can face him as our advocacy lawyer fighting our case for us. And we can embrace him 
as Lord, as Savior, as King. To embrace Him means to embrace Him for who He is, for what He has done, except by faith that He is the Son of God, except that He is God in human flesh. Repent, which simply means to turn from your way of life and turn to God's way of life and embrace Him. Believing that Jesus, His death, covers your sin. Not so you can be healthy and wealthy. Not so we can have earthly physical blessings. Not so you can avoid trouble in this life. Jesus actually promised we would have trouble in this life. He said, you can count on it, to paraphrase. He died so that we could be with him. Who cares about all this other stuff of this world if we have Jesus Christ? As we embrace the gospel of Christ and his work on the cross, that's what we get. We get Jesus. And I hope that's why you're a Christian today. I hope that when, when someone might ask the question, why are, you the, why are you a Christian? You can say, it's because I get Jesus. What do you hope to get out of your faith? Jesus Christ. Any other answer? Ultimately, it can be a form of prosperity teaching. You can have this world. You can have it, but give me Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross that when we do embrace him for who he is and embrace the, the work that he accomplished on the cross where he shed his blood so that we wouldn't have to shed ours, Thank you for the inheritance that we have in Jesus Christ. I do pray that we can all be embracing him fully in every area of life <clears throat> and looking to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, that as we, we struggle with different things in this, in this life, that we can bear all things knowing that we get to spend eternity with you. Pray, Lord, that we would all repent of, of sin, Lord, that, that holds us down and, and keeps us back. Pray that we can repent of those things because those are evidence, evidences of, of failing to embrace Christ fully. And thank you for the promise of forgiveness. And thank you for the promise of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.